Okay, this is the video corresponding to uh, chapter six, uh, roughly the first half of chapter six. Um, <clears throat> and the topic is cognitive biases. Now, first thing I wanna talk about is what cognitive biases are um, and why they're different. First off, why are they different from informal fallacies? Now, informal fallacies were problems with reasoning and they might, and in fact often would, reflect the ways people would actually consciously, explicitly reason about something. So if you ask them why they believed P, or if they're trying to convince you of P, they would actually verbally lay out exactly the, uh, the sort of pattern of reasoning that's diagnosed by the fallacy. Okay, so for example, um, false cause fallacy. People will literally go, they'll say, here's a correlation, therefore there's a certain kind of causal link. Okay, so the informal fallacies are, are diagnosing problems with people's reasoning uh, that the people are aware of. They're aware that they're reasoning, they're just not aware that, that it's fallacious. Okay, um, so you know, people will actually go from A and B are correlated to A cause B, and they'll just say that. The cognitive biases are different. They're usually subcon they're, they're operating sort of under the radar of conscious awareness, generally. People um, aren't aware of the fact that they're uh, subject to these biases. They might deny the fact that they're subject to these biases. In fact, in some cases, <clears throat> um, People will be explicitly and, uh, you know, genuinely, sincerely against the sort of thrust of the bias. So, for example, we'll, we'll talk, be talking about implicit gender bias later. And as we'll see, even women who are very, you know, feminist oriented and whatever will demonstrate implicit gender bias against women. So it's, it's a kind of thing that operates uh, subconsciously that people aren't aware of, and in fact might even be contrary to what people will genuinely, explicitly, um, and sincerely uh, believe, or say they believe, or, or avow. So the first bias I want to talk about, we're going to talk about six of these all together, uh, is the confirmation bias. And here's a rough definition, we'll get a little bit more uh, information shortly. It's a bias people have for favoring anything, um, we'll talk about what anything means, that confirms one's prior beliefs, especially beliefs that one likes or is attached to, okay? And disfavoring anything that could call those beliefs into question. Okay, so um, here's a key study. So psychologists were giving were given um, abstracts of a psychological study. And what the study tried to do was show that there are certain personality features or certain features of people that could predict their career choices, right? So when it talks about predicting behavior, that would be things like career choices, um, you know, other sorts of life choices that people would make. And there were two versions of the abstract for this for the study that psychologists would get. One of them showed a link between personality traits, like being an extrovert, and um, selecting certain kinds of careers, like being a politician versus a librarian or something like that. Um, the other one, which was identical, so these were like fake abstracts. The psychologists didn't know they were fake, but they were fake. So the, the data and, and everything that was reported in the abstract was exactly identical, except that the second one, instead of personality traits, was doing the prediction on the basis of astrological factors, like the planet alignment when, when they were born or something like that. So the methodology was identical in the two studies. And psychologists were asked to uh, rate, look, look at the abstract, look at the, the way the study was done and the data, 
and just rate how good is the methodology of the study. Now the assumption, which is almost certainly correct going into this, is that all of the psychologists had a prior belief, a set of prior beliefs. They, they believe that it's likely that personality traits play a role in things like career choices, and they probably believe that astrology is total bunk. Okay, so we sort of know what the prior beliefs of psychologists are. Turns out that psychologists would rate the quality of research or the methodology to be less good for the, uh, the astrological version of the study, which of course they shouldn't because the, the methodology is identical. The only difference is whether the result was something that already confirmed something they believed or, uh, or disconfirmed something that they believed. By the way, one thing I want to point out here is um, that, as we'll see in a lot of these studies, it's not just, you know, everyday people, you know, on the street who do these things. A lot of times, you know, people with a lot of education or people who are scientists in academia think that they're above these biases. Uh, these are psychologists, like trained psychologists. Uh, we'll see more studies later in some of the other biases where the subjects were um, scientists. So everybody is subject to these. Um, <clears throat> here's another study. This was done uh, in uh, the domain of, of political discourse. So people were shown uh, examples of possibly contradictory statements from presidential candidates. Right, so a presidential candidate would say something on one day in one speech that um, appeared to possibly contradict something that that same candidate said in a different occasion. Um, and they did it with both uh, Republican and Democratic presidential candidates. This was 2004 uh, presidential election. And what they found was that people were much more likely to interpret the statements as contradictory. So they would show the two statements to say, is this person contradicting himself? or not. And then the, the, they would be, you know, shown the two statements and then just asked. Um, and then sometimes people would say, yeah, th that's the person's contradicting himself. Or that sometimes they would say, well, no, they're not really contradicting themselves because, you know, this is a sl slightly different topic or, you know, they meant this, this time, but meant a slightly different thing the other time. So there's different ways to interpret it. And what they found, not surprisingly, is that, um, there's a typo here, this should be candidate, but that they were much more likely to interpret the statements as contradictory when they were from a candidate that they opposed, a political candidate that they opposed, as opposed to one that they uh, were in favor of. So those are a couple of examples of key studies. Now I wanna get more into the details of, of kind of how the confirmation bias can work. So <clears throat> one way it can manifest is in terms of what information people seek. Okay, so you have a set of beliefs or you're, you're trying to make a decision about something, you want to stay informed or whatever, right? But people collect information. But uh, information collection is not 100% passive. People have choices about the information they collect, about the sources of information, okay, for example. So, um, for instance, people will frequent news sources that tend to align with their prior political views. So people who are you know, lean conservative will tend to watch Fox News. People who lean more liberal will tend to watch MSNBC rather than Fox News. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with, with this effect. Um, but it happens in other cases too. Um, uh, Tanya in uh, lecture gave an example from a psychological study uh, of which asking people which cards they would have to flip over to um, to assess whether a rule was true and people would only flip over the cards that would confirm they wouldn't uh, flip the cards that would disconfirm um, the rule <clears throat> okay the next way it can manifest is how people interpret um, information that they have. 
So this would be something like the uh, presidential candidates, right? Whether you interpret what they're saying as contradictory or not. So that's not a matter of seeking out the information. These people were just given the clips of the candidate saying things. It was instead how they would interpret it. So if you already were pro-Bush, you would interpret what he was saying as not really contradictory, um, for example. Uh, whereas if you were, uh, who was his, um, I think it was Kerry that year. Um, if you were pro Kerry, you would interpret Bush as being contradictory in those statements. Um, so a more recent example is <clears throat> how people interpret the seriousness of this private email server that uh, Hillary Clinton had. Um, you know, are you going to interpret this as you know, sort of an a in innocent mistake, not a big deal, um, or as some sort of serious national security issue? And how people will interpret that depends on, to a large extent, will depend on their prior uh, beliefs. Um, uh, another election-related one, right? So even if some piece of information is the same, like, you know, say a small number of votes didn't get counted um, in some precinct or something like that, well, <coughs> depending on the results of the vote, if it turned out the way you liked or you didn't like, um, you might be more likely to interpret that either as, yeah, that's just something that's going to happen when you have, you know, a huge number of people voting in a huge number of precincts. You should, you are going to expect from time to time there's going to be some votes that don't get counted. Or are you going to interpret this as some evidence of a big fix um, that the system is rigged uh, against your candidate? <clears throat> um, it can also manifest in terms of what information um, you notice or remember. So people will be more likely to notice information um, or th whatever uh, events that confirm their bias and more likely to not remember or not notice um, information that disconfirms uh, their bias. So an example here, this is an example uh, that I saw uh, not too long ago. Um, this was uh, Obama gave a speech after uh, some police shootings in Dallas and a friend of mine who does not like Obama at all um, sort of the next day responded to the speech saying, I can't believe Obama, you know, blah, 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 and said, how, how in the world can Obama say that being a police officer is no more dangerous than, than things that everybody else do? And he went off on this big thing about how, you know, Obama's really wrong because law enforcement jobs are so much tougher than, you know, dangerous. And I thought, that's kind of weird. I thought he actually said the opposite of that. I thought he said, like, you know, law enforcement officers have a really dangerous job and, you know, they put their lives at risk. And so I went back and I watched the video. And sure enough, at the, the very beginning of his speech, the first two minutes, was Obama saying exactly the opposite of what this friend of mine had remembered. Um, so he didn't even... I mean, he saw the speech, but he either didn't notice it at first or he just forgot that part later because uh, Obama actually saying those things would disconfirm his belief about Obama being um, so radically opposed to everything he believes. So he either didn't notice it to begin with um, or forgot it immediately afterwards. Um, what's interesting is then when I pointed this out, I said, actually, you know, here's a link to the video and watch the first two minutes. He actually says exactly what you, the opposite of what you said he said. And so I, I showed it to him and he, he, his response was, oh, well, yeah, the first couple minutes he's just, you know, reading from a teleprompter and he always says, you know, the quote, correct thing. Um, and so there was the, the, another manifestation of the confirmation bias is how you interpret it. So, um, you know, Obama says something that you agree with, but did he really mean it or was he just reading off a teleprompter? So how you, how he interpreted what Obama was saying. Um, once I, once I pointed out that he actually said it, sort of got over one version of the confirmation bias, he immediately brought in a second version of the confirmation bias, which was to interpret that same piece of information in a different way. Um,
Here's another example. Um, uh, this is um, also from the 2016 election. Um, during the debates, there were actually a few things. So liberal-leaning people obviously were not fans of Trump. Um, but there were a couple of things Trump said during the debates <clears throat> that were actually very much in line with what uh, liberal progressive people would think with respect to health care, certainly much more so than some of the other people at the debates. Um, not everything he said, but there were a few things that, that he, he said that were actually things that liberals could, would normally agree with. But they never mentioned those whenever they were sort of talking about Trump and how horrible Trump was, um, or their beliefs about Trump. Um, the, the few things that Trump had said, actually, that liberals would agree with never came up. So either they uh, didn't notice them or they interpreted them at the time as, well, he doesn't really mean that or something like that. But um, it happens on both sides of the uh, political fence. So some real world manifestations of this, I mean, uh, the election stuff is obviously real world manifestation. Um, in fact, most of the things I've talked about are, but here's some more. So one is um, things like mind readers. So this is from a Nickerson 1998 study, says that uh, when the mind reader, for example, describes one character in more or less universally valid terms, right? So the mind reader will say something like, um, you're overworked, right? Well, everyone thinks they're overworked, right? Um, so uh, individuals who want to believe that their minds are being read will have little difficulty finding substantiating evidence in what the mind reader says if they focus on what fits and discounts what doesn't fit. And so if the mind reader says something that doesn't quite fit, people will just kind of ignore that and they'll focus on the things that do sort of fit. That's actually how mind readers, uh, and palm readers and psychics and stuff like that work. Hypochondriacs is uh, very similar. This is from the same uh, paper. They point out that the body more or less continually provides one with an assortment of signals, right? Like pains here or a certain kind of, you know, whatever. Um, if you pay attention to your body and all of the stuff going on, there's a huge amount of signals that are happening all the time. Body more or less continuously provides one with assortment of signals that if attended to could be interpreted as symptoms of illness of one sort or another. Normally people ignore these signals. However, if one suspects that one is ill, one is likely to begin to attend to these signals and to notice those that are consistent with the assumed illness. Ironically, acquisition of factual knowledge about diseases and their symptoms may exacerbate the problem. Upon learning of a specific illness and the symptoms that signal its existence, one may look for those symptoms in one's own body, thereby increasing the chances of detecting them even if they're not out of the normal range. So if you, someone tells you about some disease that has you know, ankle pain associated with it, then you might start paying attention to how your ankles feel and like small little pains that normally you wouldn't notice. Um, all of a sudden you notice them. That, that's the kind of thing they're talking about. <clears throat> Another place this has um, uh, been studied is in criminal investigations. So police officers uh, were given uh, investigation files to look at and they were, you know, they were um, given sort of a file and that had a lot of information in it and they would sort of go through the information. It took a little while to go through all the information. And what they found was that uh, participants who stated hypotheses early on so when they first opened the file and looked at the first couple pieces of information, said, oh, it's probably the husband who did it or, you know, so-and-so. Um, uh, they showed a bias in which evidence in the file they looked for and how they interpreted that um, evidence uh, as opposed to uh, people who didn't state a hypothesis early on. So the idea there is that once they had a hypothesis, um, they were more likely to seek out information that confirmed it. Um, interestingly, they did find that this effect lessened with experience, so it was more likely to happen with less experienced uh, investigators 
um, more likely to happen with less experienced investigators. So now I want to sort of just return to something I said earlier, because now it'll be hopefully a little more clear, which was that cognitive biases usually operate subconsciously. While they affect what people think, they usually won't appear explicitly. People aren't really aware of it. So for instance, <clears throat> people might, they'll actually say something like, yeah, um, A and B are correlated, therefore A caused B. I mean, they won't use A and B, they'll talk about real events. <clears throat> um, but that'll actually be their explicit pattern of reasoning. But you won't actually hear people say something like this. Uh, they won't say, well, I think P is true, but Q conflicts with P, so I'm going to ignore Q. People think that they're just well-informed and that they have all of the relevant data if you ask them. No one's going to say, yeah, well, there's this piece of data that just totally conflicts with what I just said, but I'm just going to ignore that and pretend it doesn't exist. No one says that because uh, they don't think they're doing it. So that's, uh, again, just to sort of go back to the point of the difference between cognitive biases and uh, one of the differences between cognitive biases and um, informal fallacies. Okay, let's move on to the next <coughs> bias, the zero-sum bias. The very rough definition of this is that it's the assumption that a situation is zero-sum when it's not. Um, what is zero-sum? A zero-sum situation is a situation in which an increase in a resource that's provided to one person or group has to be accompanied by an equal decrease in the amount of that resource provided to some other person or group. Now the resources, there's all kinds of different things. It can be resources. It can be money. It can be prestige. It could be opportunities, whatever. Um, we'll go through different examples. But in a zero-sum situation, there's a fixed amount of that resource. So if one person gets more, somebody else has to get less. Okay, uh, Situations which are not zero-sum are situations where the amount of that resource is not fixed. Okay, that it's variable. Um, okay, so here's a uh, here's here's an example. <clears throat> um, the study uh, involved uh, students, college students, and they were um, in a classroom, and they there was a grading policy for a certain assignment that was described to them, and the grades were determined by an objective measure. Okay, so there wasn't a curve. A curve is a way of making um, high grades a zero-sum resource, basically, because there's going to be a certain percentage of people will get an A, and a certain percentage will get a B, which means that if someone gets an A, someone else can't get an A. That's what a curve does. If it's not curved, if there's some objective standard, like in this case, that means that potentially and everyone could get an A or nobody could get an A, right? It's just every single person is just measured against a standard. What happens with other people don't affect um, any one person's grade, right? So grades in this um, scenario, given the grading policy are effectively an unlimited resource. Everybody can potentially get a high grade. So that's the setup. Then what happened is after um, a, you know, a, a certain big chunk of the people did their reports and got their grades assigned, students were shown the grades that were earned by those students. And here's what they found. They found that um, and then they were asked to predict the grade that would be earned by the next presenter. Now, they found, what they found was that if the students who had already presented got a lot of high grades, like, okay, you know, yeah, half the class is already gone and 90% of them got A's. What do you think, you know, what's the next person going to get? They would predict a lower grade than if the uh, first group of people got C's or D's, um, which really only makes sense if you think that uh, it's a zero-sum game, right? Because otherwise, if you realize that it's an unlimited resource, you should predict the opposite, right? If, if 
you realize because you've been told explicitly that it's an objective standard, and if the first half of the class all gets A's, really the good prediction would be that the next student's probably going to get an A. Because what it's telling you is that um, these objective standards are easy for students to meet if half the class who did it already got A's. But in fact, people will do the opposite. Um, they were sort of treating grades implicitly as a limited resource. So if a lot of students already got A's, that should mean that it's less likely that the next student will get an A. Um, another uh, study, this is Brewer and Silver 78, um, and I'll, I'll show you what this means. This, this is language that may not make sense immediately, but there are two groups. And the, they were playing a game, and the rules of the game are actually really sophisticated. I won't describe them. But basically, they involved individuals making choices about how to divide resources up between their own group and this different group. Um, and one thing that's interesting here is that the way they divided the group was completely irrelevant. They just um, asked, they had a bunch of subjects come in, and they asked them if they preferred, I think it was different types of art, like um, surrealism versus impressionism or something. I don't know, just like some really irrelevant decision. And then they would just use that to divide them up into two groups for this resource, this card game thing they were playing. So the groups were arbitrary. It wasn't like, you know, men versus women or, you know, the America's Cup where it's, you know, U.S. versus Europe or something like that, where people have some sort of prior identity associated with this group, right? It was just some irrelevant art choice. Um, so that's kind of interesting that even when the group is just set up in arbitrary, in an arbitrary way, this bias will still happen. So what does this said, say? And then I'll try to explain it. Behavioral choices, this is people choosing how they chose how to distribute resources <clears throat> that maximize differentiation, there's a typo there, between in-group and out-group outcomes. So this would be um, me deciding on dividing up a resource in such a way that it placed the biggest distance between what my group got and what the other group got. Um, those choices dominated, so people were more likely, and they sort of went to choices that, that maximized the, the difference between what their own group got and what the other group got, even when those choices meant that their own group got less overall. So here's, here's what I mean. Um, so for instance, <clears throat> these might be three different choices people could make. This is massively simplified, by the way. This is not how the actual game worked. The actual game was very much more complicated, but I'm just trying to give you the, the um, uh, summary version of it here. So this, this is sort of resource that goes to us, a resource that goes to them, and there's three different choices that can be made. Um, either we get 20 and they get 16, or we get 18 and they get 12, or we get 16 and they get eight. <clears throat> this one, is the one that maximizes what we get, right? If I choose A here, or I choose this first resource allocation, that maximizes what our group gets. And you think that, well, that's what most people should choose, right? You want more for your group. What people actually would choose is C, because that maximizes the difference, right? If I choose C, then that means our group gets double. We get eight more than the other group. Okay, um, so even though we got in-group gain, that's what this is, was less, we only got 16 instead of 20, people would choose this because it had the maximum difference between what we got and what the other group got. Um, <clears throat> this also shows up in uh, people's thinking about immigration policy. Um, so this is a study from uh, Essays et al., 2001. Um, Participants who read editorial focusing on successful participation of skilled immigrants in a difficult job market, this is uh, in Canada, um, were more likely to indicate that immigration decreases the number of jobs available to people already living in Canada. 
which suggests that they were thinking in zero-sum terms. Um, that more jobs for one group means less, I should say fewer, sorry, fewer jobs for another group. Um, now, <clears throat> the interesting thing here, or the, the thing to realize, is that jobs are not a zero-sum game. Right? As people enter an economy, yes, they do take a job, so immediately they might take a job that someone else might have, like the first week or month or something. But the fact that they're now part of the economy means they're spending money that uh, benefits businesses, so those other businesses hire people, right? So basically, as, as a population grows, whether it's through you know, birth of people already living there or immigration or whatever, as populations grow, you know, more people are in an economy, the number of jobs tends to grow, right? That's why the number of jobs in the U.S. right now isn't the same as the number of jobs we had in the year 1800 when our population was only, you know, 10 million or something like that, right? It's not like back in the year 1800, there were 10 million people and only 5 million jobs. And so now there's only 5 million jobs, right? Even though there's 300 million people here. No, as a population increases, as people enter an economy, the number of jobs also increases. So uh, the number of jobs is not zero sum. But people tend to think, uh, especially when they're thinking of immigration, they tend to think of them in zero sum uh, terms. Um, interestingly, they don't think of jobs as zero sum when they're having kids. Right? Like, well, gosh, if we have a kid, that person's going to grow up and they're going to take a job that you know someone else could get. So. You know, maybe we shouldn't have kids. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. Um, <clears throat> people have also interpreted this as playing a role in the assessment of ability and skill. So uh, products with multiple features are assumed to perform each task less well than a corresponding specialty product. Um, the idea is being somehow that um, the amount of... Uh, um, goodness or the amount of, of, I don't know, usefulness that any object can have is fixed. And so if it's dividing that up into two different tasks, right, like if you have a, uh, a screwdriver that has a flashlight built into the handle, people will assume that it's not going to be as good of a screwdriver as one that just doesn't have a flashlight in the handle. Um, it's also manifests in people with multiple specializations. Um, which are just assumed to be less good at each at each specialization than someone who only specializes in one uh, one thing. <clears throat> um, it's also uh, connected to the zero sum bias is connected to what's called social dominance orientation, and uh, social dominance orientation it's a psychological thing that can be measured, but it's um, it's associated with, with people who have the belief that inequality is inevitable, um, that groups necessarily relate in zero-sum terms, um, that it's uh, associated with the desire for one's in-group, so people who are like you, whether it's you know a certain racial group or you know your gender group or whatever, um, uh, desire for one's in-group to hold more power and higher status than other groups. So. There's psychological tests you can do to people to sort of rank them on this social dominance orientation scale. And some people are really high on that scale and some people are really low on the scale. And people who rank highly on that scale um, tend to think of things in zero-sum terms. So there's a correlation there. Okay, uh, I want to move on to the next bias. This is the availability bias. So first, a rough definition. Um, it's a tendency to assess probabilities. So what does this mean? People assess probabilities all the time. Um, how likely is it that there's going to be a traffic jam on your normal route uh, home after school or after work? Uh, how likely is it that if you go to the store, they're going to have um, a certain product that you want to buy? Um, and based on your assessment of how likely that is, you, maybe you'll go to that store, maybe you won't. Um, how likely is it that uh, a certain activity will be dangerous? Uh, 
right? If you go skiing, will you get injured and have a knee injury? Um, so people are assessing probabilities all the time um, about events in the world. Now, the bias is it's a tendency to assess probabilities on the basis of examples that are easily available, um, either in reality or in imagination. <clears throat> so here's a study, and this is kind of an artificial example, but it gives you the idea. We'll talk about um, more realistic examples shortly. Subjects were asked to judge whether a random English word would be more likely to have the letter K as its first letter or as its third letter. Now, in fact, there are two to three times as many words in English that have K as the third letter. Bake, make, take, um, those all have K as third letter. Um, but people judge that having it as a first letter is more likely, and that's because it's, it's way easier for people to think of examples. So if you just ask people to list examples of words that start with letter K, or examples of words that have K as the third letter, people will think of a lot more examples. So they can think of examples more readily of K being the first letter, so they judge that to be more probable. Um, now, that was really artificial. Here's a more real-world application of this. So, um, in some locations, at some times, in some circumstances, um, the punishments that are associated with certain kinds of criminal activity are influenced by public opinion. So there might be surveys or in, you know, in one way or another, um, the uh, public's opinion on certain, uh, what would be appropriate punishments for certain crimes plays a role in actual uh, legal and judicial policy. The issue is that the public's opinion might be skewed in various ways. And so um, this, that's what this study uh, looked at. It said public opinion polls on citizens' punishment preferences are increasingly employed to support enactment of laws requiring mandatory minimum prison sentences um, and to support harsher sentences by judges. Punishment preferences are dependent upon the ease with which stories of severe harm and those of minor harm come to mind. Okay, so for example, I think... Um, people were asked uh, um, if someone's getting mugged, how likely is it that the uh, person who's being mugged is going to get injured? And people thought, in general, most people put the probability very high, like something like 50% or something like that. So they thought like 50% of the time when someone's mugged, there's, there's physical injury involved, the person. In fact, that's much lower I forget the exact number, but I think it was like 5% or something like that. So people massively overestimated the amount of, of harm, like physical, like violence, actual, as opposed to just theft of money that was involved in um, uh, muggings. As a result, those same people uh, would lobby for harsher punishments for mugging. Okay. Um, the study continues, while violent crimes from mass media fueled demands for harsher punishments, the use of more realistic stereotypes lowered cries for harsher punishments. So what they found, but when they say a more realistic stereotype, they found that people who either themselves or who knew people who had been mugged, especially like multiple times, they would know that, ah, yeah, actually, you, you know, you don't get hurt most of the time, right? They've been mugged person just, you know, took their wallet or took $20 or whatever and left, right? So people who had like a more realistic idea of what actually went on, um, they had better probability assessments than the people who, whose examples were from the media or movies or whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's also uh, manifest in things like um, lottery ticket sales. So, um, you know, 
advertising for lottery tickets or if you go to Las Vegas advertising, you know, they have advertisement for slot machines and they have, you know, big picture of someone who won a million dollars, you know, last week or something, you know, right above where all the slot machines are. So the advertising focuses on winners, hence people have more examples. They can think of more examples of winners than of losers. So they come up with a, an inaccurate probability assessment of how likely it is that they will win. Um, so they're more likely to actually play uh, lottery or whatever. Um, now, if you think about it, there's um, an interesting interaction between confirmation bias and the availability bias. Remember, the confirmation bias was the first one we talked about, where people tend to seek out things that confirm their beliefs. So if you're more likely to seek examples that confirm your beliefs about something, then your estimate of what reality is like, how likely certain things are to happen, how, how often things happen, is influenced by the fact that you have more examples of that sort of thing available. So one example is um, uh, gun, gun laws, the pro pro-gun versus gun control um, debate. People who uh, are pro-gun, they think it's a good idea for people to be, you know, packing their own guns around. They seek out, they tend to seek out um, news stories um, or sites that are likely to provide news stories about people who successfully defended themselves um, because they had a gun. Um, so stories about, you know, someone who was at home and someone broke into their house, but they defended themselves. Or um, a sto someone who happened to be in a mall when somebody else broke out a knife and started stabbing people and they shot the person and saved some people's lives. So examples where um, pro-gun uh, uh, policies had what you might think of as a positive effect. And less likely to seek out stories or pay attention to or whatever, uh, remember um, examples of, of cases where, you know, the toddler finds the gun and accidentally shoots um, his brother or something like that. Um, you know, accidental in-home shootings or things where the fact that people had firearms goes wrong as opposed to right. And people who um, are anti, you know, who wants tougher gun control, they have the opposite pattern, right? They're, they're more likely to um, seek out or just be um, on, uh, you know, news sources that are more likely to give examples of these sorts of, you know, accidental shootings um, as opposed to examples of people actually successfully defending themselves or their family against a, a violent attack or something like that. So the, the confirmation bias, which sort of influences what kinds of examples people seek out, then gives them examples. So when they try to sort of think of how likely is it that something happens, how, how likely is it, you know, what's the relative likelihood that if you have a gun, you're going to actually, um, it's going to end up killing someone in your own family or yourself <clears throat> versus save you or someone in your family from an, from an attack. So people try to sort of estimate the relative probabilities of these events. Of course, their estimation of those events, um, how likely they think it is, is governed by the availability of these examples, which was then itself governed by their confirmation bias. So these, these different biases can actually work together to sort of polarize political opinions. <clears throat> um, so how you interpret what you see then creates the examples that influence your probability assessments. Um, okay, so I think I'll end it there. Um, those are the first three biases. The next uh, the next video will cover uh, the next three.